Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philippe Gubel. I'm the, I have the immense pleasure to be the department head of the Department of Aerospace Engineering here at Illinois. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 Stillwell Lecture. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is a lecture the department created a few years ago to honor the founder, the founder of the department. Uh, Professor Stillwell created or founded the department in 1944 when he was only 27 years old, which is quite spectacular. Um, he, he started the department from scratch. He was originally at the University of Minnesota, if I remember well and then uh, came to Champaign and started a whole department. So the department will celebrate next year its 75th anniversary, and I hope to see all of you in the many events that we have in mind for that, uh, for that event, uh, for, the, for that year. Um, so the department created this uh, lecture series to honor uh, Professor Stilwell, who studied the department and remained as department head for 32 years, uh, which is really, really remarkable. So, um, and so it's my pleasure to welcome you here and to introduce the speaker for this year's lecture. Uh, I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Professor Zach Putnam. Hi, it's nice to see so many people here. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, the Stillwell speaker for this year, uh, which is uh, Professor Dean Bobby Braun. Uh, he is a recognized authority in the development of entry, descent, and landing systems and the advancement of space technology. Uh, he is currently the Dean of the College of, College of Engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, where he is also a professor in aerospace engineering sciences. Um, prior to that, uh, he was on the faculty at Georgia Tech from 2003 to 2016. And before that, he spent 16 years at the NASA Langley Research Center um, uh, in between there, he served as the NASA Chief Technologist uh, in 2010 and 2011, uh, the first person to serve in that post uh, at NASA headquarters. He is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, Vice Chair of the National Academy of Space Studies Board, and a fellow of the AAA and AAS, and the author or co-author of over 300 technical publications in atmospheric flight dynamics, planetary exploration, design, optimi design optimization, and systems engineering. Uh, so let's give uh, Dr. Braun a warm welcome. I'm looking forward to his talk. Thank you all too. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great, great. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for being here, and, and thank you for the warm welcome both just now and, and throughout the day. Um, I've got to say, I. I've been on the campus before, um, but I had the chance to walk around and talk to folks in the department today. And uh, yeah, you guys are, are doing big things here. And the department is clearly on the rise. Um, the faculty that you've been hiring and the, the students that I got to meet today are just exceptional. So I, I just appreciate the opportunity to get to uh, interact with so many people. Uh, I also appreciate the opportunity to get a chance to talk to you about my professional passion uh, which is uh, entry, descent, and landing. Um, it's one of these areas uh, that, you know, when I started, uh, you know, actually when I was younger than actually many of the people here in the room today, I knew I wanted to do entry, descent, and landing, but I didn't know what it was called because back then they just didn't have a, a term for it. Uh, when I was a young kid uh, growing up in Maryland, I actually watched uh, from outside the control room as they landed the Viking 1 spacecraft on Mars in July of uh, 1976. And it was a, uh, you know, like a Super Bowl moment for me as a kid, something I always, always remember. And I remember thinking back then, I was like 11 years old, I remember thinking, you know, that's something I'd like to do one day. Uh, and then of course, like most kids, I went on to have other dreams. I thought I'd be a professional football player, but you know, that didn't work out so well. I'm, I'm not sure why, I mean, you know. You, I could have made it, right? Uh, I thought about you know, playing guitar in a rock band, and you know, I just didn't have the talent for that. So eventually, I got back into engineering, uh, actually at, at Penn State, a large uh, public university like this one. Uh, went into aerospace engineering, uh, and was fortunately hired into NASA right out of uh, my bachelor's degree into a place where they were looking for people to figure out how to land 
big things on Mars. That was actually the first job I was given at NASA. And so I started working on that job, and then eventually uh, these folks came to my office one day, and they said, you know, I know you're working on how to land people on Mars, but uh, we've got this little robot we want to land on the surface of Mars. No one's landed on the surface in 20 years. Can you come help us figure out how to do that? And of course, uh, these folks are from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I was thrilled to be part of that team, and so I joined the Mars Pathfinder team uh, and worked in the development of the entry, descent, and landing system. This was a system that included you know, an aeroshell uh, you know, to slow down hypersonically, a supersonic disc gap band parachute, and then uh, airbags to actually cushion the you know, retro rockets and then airbags to actually cushion the final descent. Um, and I actually, I built the simulation that was used, uh, you know, to design this system and to actually fly it through space. I don't know, how many of you saw them land Curiosity at JPL back in 2012? You might remember that. So you saw there were like hundreds of people in the control room, and they all had matching shirts, and you know, they were fancy consoles. There were actually four of us, uh, a total of four, that navigated this spacecraft from launch all the way to the surface of Mars. And so it was a tremendous learning opportunity for me and the others on that team. Uh, it was uh, marvelously successful. We all kind of thought it would be, but we had really no idea if it would be. Um, and so this, this actually became my Super Bowl moment in July 4th, 1997, uh, when this image came back from Mars so showing the Sojourner rover. Sojourner, by the way, was about the size of a little baby. I know you just, you just had a baby, so it's roughly <laughs> the size of your baby, 11 kilograms. Uh, and it was my baby, believe me. For like five years, all I thought about was this baby being busted up into all kinds of pieces. And so to see that image, you know, there it is on the surface of Mars, it was just, you know, the most amazing moment. And coming out of Mars Pathfinder, they actually created something that didn't exist when I was your age. They created the Mars Exploration Program, and it's a robotic program that has continually sent landers and, landers and orbiters to Mars in various opportunities so that we could learn about, you know, Mars from a scientific basis and prepare to one day send humans to Mars. And these are the missions that are currently in existence, uh, to some extent or not. You know, Opportunity is having some trouble right now. Uh, but these are the missions that are currently in existence or have it just completed uh, on Mars all the way on the left there. And uh, we, of course, have missions in development. Uh, we have the MAVEN mission in 2013 that's in existence. We have InSight that's on the way. And we have uh, the Mars 2020 rover uh, that's being prepped now for launch to go to Mars. Mars 2020 is a little bit bigger, but basically the same uh, as the Mars Science Laboratory. It's going to be more capable scientifically, and it's going to land more precisely, but it's going to use the same kind of approach when it launches in 2020 and lands in 2021. So if you start with Pathfinder and you go through the current day, uh, once MSL landed back, back in 2012, that was about 20 years for me working on these Mars landings. And I've had the opportunity in those 20 years, not including these missions, uh, which haven't happened yet, I've had the opportunity in those 20 years to work on six Mars landings. And you know, when I was a kid watching that Viking mission, I never would have guessed that that would have been the case for me. You know, I thought maybe like, you know, when I'm 50 or 60, if I work hard, I'll eventually get to land one thing on Mars. But to get to work on six, by the way, five of them were successful just so you know, not all of them were successful, which is also a key tenet of engineering, right? If you're pushing the edge, if you're, if you're going after cutting edge things, not all of you are gonna be successful in everything you try, and that's okay. For me, the second landing was not successful, but I didn't stop, and I was part of more, uh, you know, and so five of those six are successful. And the one that you're probably most familiar with is uh, the Mars Science Laboratory that landed in August of 2012, uh, you know, it was an amazing event. It was very different than the Mars Pathfinder or the Mars Exploration rover landings. You know, those were much smaller rovers being taken to different types of terrain. This was a rover roughly the size of a small car that had to be landed very gently because of the mass and the energy uh, associated with that landing. So, uh, of course, it had a hypersonic phase. That's what we call entry. It had a supersonic phase that starts with a supersonic disc gap band parachute and then decelerates quickly into subsonic conditions. 
Uh, it then, in this case, uh, the descent stage was released from the back shell and the rover and the descent stage came down propulsively until it entered the sky crane phase, which was the final phase of landing. And of course, you know from the videos and, and from watching it real that we set this rover down at less than 0.75 centimeters per second uh, of vertical velocity. So very, very gently uh, at the end of the mission. Uh, this was a phenomenal event. It was actually, you know, because the internet had come of age, this was a worldwide, you know, generational event. I can go anywhere and talk about Mars, and almost everybody I talk to remembers this, this day, even though it was, you know, six years ago now, right? It's hard to believe that it was six years ago. So as I was saying, um, Mars Science Laboratory is the last successful landing, and we have one on the way right now, InSight. It's going to be a smaller mission, but it's on the way right now. Uh, it was, it, MSL, in terms of bigger and better missions, was the last in the series that started really with Pathfinder, uh, because it's a whole new generation of people that were doing things relative to Viking back in the 70s. And prior to MSL, there had been, if you include Viking, the two Viking landers, there had been six successful robotic landings on Mars. The thing is, they all went to the low elevation sites on Mars, right? You see this? This is a, a map, basically a percent surface area versus surface elevation here on the x-axis. This is negative surface elevation, so if there were a sea level on Mars, this would be it, right? And we're going below sea level is where we're basically landing on Mars. Anybody know why that is? This is an engineering class, right? Eh, flat is good, but, but that's not really why we want to go low. Why do you think we want to go low? All the way in the back there. For the interesting biases? Uh, sort of, yeah. If you're looking for water, water flows downhill, so that's definitely true, yeah. You get more there we go. There's that EDL guy right there. It's all about the atmosphere, right? And the big difference between Mars and the Earth is, is the atmosphere. When you're, I mean, there are other differences as well, but for an entry, descent, and landing problem, the challenge that we have is we're trying to slow down from something close to low Earth orbit velocities to zero uh, by the time you get to what on the Earth would be like 100, 120, you know, 1,000, uh, uh, like 100 kilometers, really, uh, in altitude. So we're going to these low sites because that's where the density is, and we're trying to slow down. Uh, now, MSL uh, took us a big step forward uh, in terms of mass, in terms of landing accuracy, and actually in terms of landed elevation. It was, uh, you know, we had only gone, we'd only landed masses less than 600 kilograms at elevations below 1.4 kilometers prior to MSL, and we had only landed them in footprints that were on order of 100 kilometers. In other words, I couldn't tell you what, exactly where it was going to land, you know, to within 100 kilometers is about the best I could do. Meanwhile, all of these systems had relied on these technologies that I've already referenced. Heat shields, uh, in this case, made of something called SLA-561V. The V there stands for Viking, because it was invented in the 60s, flown in, and proven on Viking, and then used ever since. The 70-degree sphere cone, also proven in a technology program prior to Viking. And the disc gap band parachute was developed in a big test program that took place in the late 60s and early 70s as they were getting ready for Viking. And so what all of these prior missions, and to some extent MSL had in common, is they were relying on this same technology base. And what I'm going to show you later in this presentation is that we're about at the limit of that technology base. If we want to eventually land humans on Mars or land a rover twice the size of the MSL rover, we're going to have to do something different. And you can kind of get a sense for what I'm talking about on this slide. So in my professional career, we've gone from landing rovers that look like this to landing rovers that look like this, right? So you can see the mass numbers on here, significantly different in mass, you know, more than an order of magnitude increase. You can get a sense for the instrument complexity, you know, then what the scientific potential of this rover is relative to this rover. I like to say that this rover is nuclear powered, and it's, you know, one of its number one instruments is to shoot a laser at rocks. I mean, come on, when I was a kid thinking about Viking, 
landing a nuclear-powered rover that shot a laser on Mars? I mean, come on. Who wouldn't want to do that? But yeah, the payloads are, have grown cons consistently. I'll show you on the next slide that the touchdown velocity requirements, as you land something this small, you can imagine that you can mitigate that last little bit of energy in some ways that you can't do with something this big, right? At least not within a reasonable cost. And so you have to change the way that you consider landing. And that's why the Pathfinder system doesn't look like the MSL system, right? It's because it's different requirements for the landing that drive different descent requirements that even drive differences in the entry phase, okay? And then, of course, landing accuracy. I mentioned that these guys landed in very broad regions. And as you probably remember, this one landed in a much smaller region. And we're going to even do much better than that in 2020. Uh, coming up. So this is a slide that talks about those touchdown velocity requirements and what it shows, and I'm, I'm showing it this way because we're going to use these axes in a bunch of later slides. This is vertical velocity, this is at the moment of touchdown, vertical velocity on the y-axis versus horizontal velocity on the x-axis. And what's shown here are the qualification boxes for each of the missions. So actually this guy up here it's kind of funny when I think about it. But the original concept for Mars Pathfinder, and very few people know this, when we sold Mars Pathfinder to NASA and they said, go ahead, do that mission, here's your check, you know, go make it happen, we told them we could do that. And, and that mission at the top there, that mission was an entry system with a parachute and an airbag. It was one system for entry, one system for descent, and one system for landing about as simple of a system engineering challenge as you could come up with. The problem was we couldn't get our airbags to survive at 30 meters per second of vertical velocity. When we smashed them on the rocks at 30 meters per second, they ripped and tore and we had all kinds of problems. So Mars Pathfinder had to go to this big uh, ellipse down here. We had to reduce the vertical velocity and when we did, we introduced more errors actually in the horizontal velocity, and that's why we added retro rockets, right, in our system. By the way, we added those retro rockets about a year before launch. There was no retro rockets in the system until after CDR, Critical Design Review. And we added them at that time totally because we couldn't make that system work. So this is Mars Pathfinder landing at something like 12 meters per second vertical velocity. And because, you know, the retro rockets are on a swinging platform that's got a parachute above it, we didn't know which way the retro rockets would be pointed, and so you could get a pretty large range in horizontal velocity. But we could prove on Earth that this system would work, and so we were able to launch Mars Pathfinder. Now, Mars Exploration Rovers, the next step up, this is a rover like the size of uh, like those little electric cars that maybe if you have kid brothers or sisters at home that they drive around in the driveway, you know, those battery-powered kind of cars, or maybe your kids have one, they need one. Well, so the Mars Exploration rovers are about that size. And because they're higher in mass and they're bigger, those same airbags couldn't land them at this same horizontal velocity. So the big development effort on Mars Exploration rovers was to shrink the horizontal velocity. And we did so by adding uh, basically a poor man's terrain relative navigation system. So during the descent, we added a camera that would look at high contrast features, and those high contrast features are crater walls, and we would take like three images is all we could take, compare them and get an estimate of our horizontal velocity, and then we added retro rockets, another set called TIERS, transverse retro rockets, and depending on our horizontal velocity, we would command either a, a small firing of those additional retro rockets in this direction or this direction or this direction to make sure that our horizontal velocity was small as it could be. And that's what we did for MER. We qualified airbags for that system. But then when we went to land larger systems like MSL, we were already having all these troubles with airbags. And by the way, these systems are nothing compared to our 900 kilogram, you know, Mars Science Laboratory. So basically, we had to come up with a whole new approach for Mars Science Laboratory. And because of its mass and where it was headed, because of the science it wanted to do, it had to land, as I was saying, at less than 0.75 meters per second in uh, vertical velocity and less than about half a meter per second in horizontal velocity. And that's where the sky crane was born. 
Now, the sky crane costs a lot more than MER or the Pathfinder system, but you can see right here from an engineering point of view what it's able to deliver in terms of landing requirements. And that's what makes that system, you know, so functional. Uh, we also made, have made great improvements in that same 20 years in our ability to land accurately. Now, this, these ellipses don't actually exist all on one spot. I've super, you know, I've moved them around on Mars. We landed on all different places on Mars. But these are the uncertainty ellipses uh, from the entry, descent, and landing simulations for Viking, Pathfinder, MER, Phoenix, and MSL, okay, Mars Science Laboratory. And I've superimposed them all down on Gusev Crater, which is where uh, the Mars Science Laboratory landed. Now, these improvements, all the way to MER and to Phoenix, all of those systems flew ballistically. They flew without lift, drag only to slow us down in the hypersonic phase. The big change on the Mars Science Laboratory is we flew with an offset center of gravity, so we had a symmetric shape that generated a lift vector, and then we had an onboard control system that could orient that lift vector autonomously as it's descending through the Mars atmosphere, could orient that lift vector up or down or left or right to kind of control this error. And that's how we went from something on the order of 100 kilometers to something on the order of 20 kilometers in major axis uh, error. That was, by the way, something that we had been proposing for years. And you know, we knew, I mean, actually they did it on Apollo, right? They did it on Gemini. We do it on, did it on the space shuttle. So this wasn't a new development. It was new for Mars. And MSL was the first time we flew uh, an autonomous guidance algorithm at Mars. But this algorithm was very similar to algorithms that we had flown hypersonically in the past. In fact, this over here, this portion of the slide is from a technology roadmap that a group of us created back in the 1990s on how we would eventually land within a football field on Mars. And you can see that we wanted to do autonomous aero maneuvering. This is what they did on MSL. And then we started talking about terrain matching, basically taking images of the terrain and flying terrain relative navigation to the ground. This is what we're going to do in a poor man's version, of, at least, uh, on the Mars 2020 mission. And so we're going to greatly reduce our footprint down to on the order of a kilometer or a few hundred meters. We're going to let the system decide as it's descending which of several uh, landing spots it should ultimately go to when we send Mars 2020 to the surface. And I can show you what that looks like from this slide. This is just a, a study of that effect. So this, this first plot here is showing the way we have done it, like for Mars Science Laboratory and other missions in the past, right? And this has an error of like something like plus or minus 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers total in major axis. And what we've done here is colored the different phases of the mission in different colors. So the blue there is the entry phase where you're operating with an autonomous uh, bank angle control out guidance algorithm. Uh, then we have the parachute descent, des de descent phase, which for MSL is just a, a parachute just coming down, right? So there's no control over this phase. And then in red here, we have the propulsive descent phase. So you can kind of get a sense that a lot of the error is coming from that transition between entry and parachute descent phase, right? So what we wanted to do on MSL, what we thought of very late in MSL, too late for the project managers to go along with adding it to the mission, but uh, which we are going to do for Mars 2020, is do something called smart shoot. So now when we, in this image over here, you can see that that transition between the blue and the yellow is much more uh, consistent with altitude, right? It looks more like a stream tube as opposed to kind of a random set uh, of transition points. And so by doing this, by having some software on board that knows where we are, because we're flying with an IMU, we can include range, downrange, as part of the logic in when we deploy the parachute. And that's going to take us to something like plus or minus three or four kilometers, OK? Then, if we had enough propellant on board, we could actually fly down to a football field, right? Because we could take images of the surface, and you know, if we're over here and we want to go over there, we just fly over there. And if we're way over here and we want to go over there, we fly over there. But it takes a lot of propellant to do that, from three to four kilometers 
when you're only a, like one or so kilometer up in altitude. So what we, we can't carry all that propellant on the Mars 2020 system. So instead of going to just one possible site, what we have is a series of safe zones, football field size safe zones that have been, that are also scientifically interesting. And the Mars 2020 vehicle is going to come down with this kind of error and it's going to fly to whichever safe zone is closest. So for the first time in 2021 when we send this rover to Mars, the people back home aren't going to know exactly where it's going to land. We'll only know that on the flight day. And to me, that's, that's pretty exciting. So I've been mentioning that MSL uh, took some big steps forward, right? It was the largest uh, entry mass system with the largest payload that we ever sent to Mars. We used the largest aeroshell and flew it through the highest designed aerothermodynamic environment. This, of course, assumed turbulent heating, which actually didn't occur in flight, so we didn't see this level of heating, but the system was designed for that. Because of this level of heating, we used a different thermal protection system. We did not fly SLA 561V for the first time at Mars. We used a different uh, TPS system. I mentioned the guidance algorithm and the largest disk gap band chute, um, and so on and so on. We, we pulled out basically all the stops, or many of the stops that we could think of for MSL, and the stops that we didn't pull out for MSL, we're pulling out for 2020. And that's really exciting, except 2020, instead of being 900 kilograms, it's 950. And so you might ask yourself, well, that's great, Dr. Braun, or you can call me Bobby, that's great. Um, and it is great, but what are we going to do for this challenge? Right? I mean, you all saw the Martian. How did, how did Mark Watley land? You know, it, it didn't, he didn't land in a sky crane, and he certainly didn't land in airbags, right? And so the other thing that I've had the great pleasure of being able to work on in my career is kind of thinking forward multi-decades to what might be possible when we try to send humans to Mars. And that real challenge goes like this. Um, I know how to land something that's roughly one metric ton. What is the system that's going to land something that's, I don't know, 20 tons, 80 tons? You, you tell me. I mean, it's, there's actually not a, a known number for what this system is going to look like. Um, I do know that humans have landed on, on planetary objects before, right? We've been to the moon. This is actually the largest lander known ever built. Uh, it landed at about 15 tons on the moon. Here's an astronaut on the moon. I've just superimposed them on Mars. This is one of the beauties of Photoshop, right? <laughs> we actually didn't do this. Uh, but I superimposed them at the same scale as this image, which is a NASA image of what it's going to look like when we land on Mars. Check out these HABs, these landed elements, compared to the lunar excursion module, which you, know, you can go look at in a museum and see how crazy big this thing is compared to the little Sojourner rover, right, that you couldn't even see in this image, right? Check out this Jeep that this guy gets to drive around, right? I mean, that's a big vehicle. Uh, and these, these, uh, these two-story houses, basically, that we've landed on Mars, one right next to another so that we can plug them in and connect them and stuff. Now, that's precision landing, right? And where are the aeroshells and the parachutes and all the other things that were used to land these things safely. Like, let's say this one landed first. All those things should be thrown around on the surface, right? And then there are hazards for this guy that's coming down afterwards. You don't ever see that in the NASA cartoons. And so the question that I, that I and many of my students have been addressing for years is, you know, how do we land something this big on Mars? And so to analyze that, I'm going to go back to some of these uh, same plots, I call these EDL phase space plots, and they basically plot altitude on the y-axis versus velocity on the x-axis. So here we're coming in from the upper left, and we're flying towards the origin, right? Because the origin is zero altitude, zero velocity. That's where we want, need to be to land roughly safely, okay? And what I've shown on here are these uh, boxes, these domains, in altitude velocity space where we have qualified existing systems. So basically there's a region in space where if you want to deploy uh, a supersonic disk gap band parachute, you have to be in a certain density 
and a certain velocity, right? You can't deploy a parachute in space very well, right, as an example. Uh, and obviously it has to be at supersonic velocities and things like that because it's called a supersonic deployment. Uh, so this is our uh, qualified supersonic parachute deployment region. This is our qualified subsonic deployment region. And this green guy is our subsonic propulsion region. And what I really want you to look at is the difference between Earth in the top and Mars in the bottom. Right? Where's my guy called out density? He's back there somewhere. Yeah. So density is our driver here, right? That's the big difference. Right? Look how big these things are and how high they are in altitude on Earth compared to Mars. So on Earth, you know, we use supersonic parachutes all the time to slow down. We use them like for stability reasons, for instance. And then if we deploy a supersonic parachute on the Earth at let's say 40 kilometers. There's no big deal. I got tons of time to orient my capsule or whatever I'm flying towards the ground, to find the ground with a radar, to get set up for landing, uh, to maybe you know, use propulsion or to use a subsonic parachute on the Earth. Everything, you know, the Earth is a great place to live, right? And it's a great place to slow down. On Mars, that same box is maybe five to 10 kilometers above the ground. And so that timeline gets compressed tremendously, and that drives us significantly. So any system that lands on Mars safely today has to go through these boxes. So for example, here's such a system uh, coming in. It comes in from way over here. It's decelerating on its aeroshell. It gets to this box, right, and it deploys its supersonic parachute usually right away. And then the deceleration goes straight across because it's such a big increase in drag area. If I wanted to, I could deploy another parachute, but on Mars we choose not to do so because you know, it's just another system to deploy. And my supersonic parachute is, is not great subsonically, but it's okay. And so then I come down here on that one parachute and very late in the game I turn on the propulsion. Right? This is what we did on Pathfinder, on Phoenix. Uh, on MSL, on MER, we turn on the propulsion very late, and then we land. Well, what's interesting is if, I, if my parachute doesn't deploy, and I just continue with my aeroshell down to the ground, this is like Mach 1 on Mars. I'm gonna, that, that thing's going to hit the ground supersonically. Like on Earth, you can at least, you know, be with me, you can imagine that you're going to be subsonic, at least, because of our thick atmosphere. And so all of our missions on Mars have to go through these regions as they go to the surface. In fact, I can plot them all for you. All of those different missions, different sizes, uh, you know, some of them were ballistic, some were lifting. So here I have Viking, Pathfinder, the two MER missions, Phoenix and MSL. Uh, Mars 2020 is going to be very similar on this plot to MSL. And here they are decelerating from entry conditions through the hypersonic phase, going into supersonic flight around here, and then supersonic parachute deployments down to the surface. They all use propulsion at the end, right? All those missions do. Well, so what's the problem? We can just do that, right? Well, it turns out that as you try to stick more and more mass in the same size box, you have a challenge. So the ballistic coefficient goes up. And the ballistic coefficient is the ratio of inertial to drag forces. And so as you increase ballistic coefficient, you basically decelerate lower and lower in the atmosphere, okay? And so all of our systems so far have been in the ballistic coefficient of 60 to about 150 range. They're in this range. And that's why we're able to use these same technologies to get into this supersonic box and then to come across to this subsonic propulsion box. What do you think happens for this guy? He's waiting to deploy his parachute and he, you know, he's going to wait a long time, and he's going to hit the ground at Mach, I don't know, one and a half or something, right? And so on Mars, there's something that I call the supersonic decelerator gap. Uh, and Rob Manning and I, fr Rob from JPL and I, came up with this term back in uh, like 2006 when we were looking at what was uh, NASA's cartoon for how, you know, they call it design reference mission, but I'll call it a cartoon. Uh, for, for how they're going to land humans on Mars. Because you'd see these kind of images. Here, here's their ellipse sled flying really nicely, hypersonically. And then you see those, the next page, you see those landers on the surface. 
plugged in, connected together. There's the Jeep. There's the guy ready to go, right? But they never told me how they got from here to here. And so I would ask the NASA guys that worked on that about that, and they would say, typical NASA fashion, they would say, engineering. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, what kind of engineering? Is there some you know, electrical in there? I mean, is it mechanical? Is, what kind of system allows me to skip the parachute that's the only way we know how to slow down? And so basically, my question was, how do we get from flying kind of sideways at a high angle of attack on a slender body vehicle hypersonically, how do we get from there to this? Subsonically touching down at almost no speed vertically on exactly the spot that I'm looking for. And how do we go from there to there in like 90 seconds on Mars? Because it's not like the Earth. You only got 90 seconds. And in that 90 seconds, you have to slow down from Mach 5 to less than the speed of sound. You've got to get rid of your aero shell. You've got to reorient, reorient from going you know, kind of horizontally to vertically. You've got to translate to your landing site because you're not going to drop all this stuff right on top of your landing site. You're going to want to do it over there and then maneuver over here to, to where you're going to want to live. And how do you do all that before hitting the ground when the ground is at roughly 100,000 feet here on the Earth, right? When the space shuttle was reentering, and you all are old enough that you remember the space shuttle reentering. So when the space shuttle was reentering, did it stop as it passed through 100,000 feet? I mean, it was pretty much going hypersonically through 100,000 feet. It stopped at sea level, right? And we're missing all of that altitude. We're missing all of that density on Mars. And that's the real challenge. So uh, NASA folks uh, and many of my students over the years have studied this problem. And there are a number of technologies out there for how to solve this problem. There are ways uh, either in the supersonic domain or in the hypersonic domain uh, to solve this problem. Um, you can imagine different systems instead of parachutes. You can imagine using propulsion, not just in the subsonic domain, but in the supersonic domain. You can imagine using more lift to extend that hypersonic flight longer without losing altitude. There are a couple of things you could do, and uh, they're documented. Many of them are documented in this paper that Rob Manning and I wrote back in 2007. And then many of those technologies have since been studied by NASA or by university uh, folks. So these are just a handful of the projects, for instance, that my research group, formerly at Georgia Tech and now at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, has been working with folks at NASA uh, and with folks in industry that are focused on you know, Mars exploration. And there are plenty of those folks out there, by the way. So I'm going to walk you through just a couple of these. I don't have time to go through five or six different uh, technologies. I don't you know, want to bore you with that. But I'll show you just a couple of the kinds of things that, we're wor that we've been working on. So one, you know, you've heard me talk about this supersonic disk gap band parachute a few times. And it's actually a great system if you want to wait until Mach 2 to start slowing down. Parachutes don't do real well above Mach 2. They have something called area oscillation. There's a lot of dynamics. They tend to rip themselves apart. Or there's, there's also heating. And even though we've gotten better materials, you know, deploying a parachute at Mach 3 or Mach 4 is not something that people want to do. But there are concepts for these things called inflatable aerodynamic decelerators. And th uh, this is an, an example of an attached inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. And these devices, because they're enclosed and because we have much better materials now than when they were originally conceived back in the 1960s, these things are quite feasible to construct. And they can be deployed at Mach 4, Mach 5, because you can design them to take the heating. And so you can go and increase your drag area by 50% or 100%, let's say at Mach 5. And then you can fly that thing all the way down to subsonic conditions. They don't do very well subsonically, much worse than a parachute subsonically. And so, but now all you got to do is design a subsonic parachute that's easy to test here on the Earth. And so you wouldn't have to go through that supersonic high altitude technology development program that they went through on Viking if such a system existed. Now, a couple of my students have worked on this for a number of years, both at universities and then um, more recently at JPL. Uh, we did a study that showed that if we just took the MSL system and we added a supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, uh, given the same uh, volume, we could take 43% more mass 
to the same altitude point, and we would actually uh, you know, deploy that thing at a higher altitude, and so we'd have more time to find the ground. We could actually carry, you know, half of that mass might end up being propellant, which means we could improve landing accuracy, or we could land at higher elevation sites, which is something that interests the science community. So this is something that we did a lot of work on. And then after we did analysis of this, the folks at JPL uh, actually started building these things. And they built a number of test articles. Uh, this one happens to be, a, so they have a four and a half meter diameter aeroshell that pops out with a six meter attached supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. So it's about a 60% increase in drag area uh, in the supersonic domain relative to MSL. Uh, the thing's rigidized, so I mean, I'll show you a video in a second, but when it pops out, it just pops, uh, and it's like almost fixed. Uh, and it was shown that we could operate that device around Mach 4 that would give us a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit. So let me see if I can, uh, see this part is boring. So basically, we uh, built this device, we added it to this aeroshell, and we went out into the desert, fired rockets. So this is not a, the right, um, it's not supersonic, but it's the right dynamic pressure. And, the right, uh, and so we basically did a structural test of this device. Uh, first on the ground, it worked really well. And then we took this system up to high altitude uh, off the coast of Hawaii, we flew a rocket and flew this system up over 100,000 feet, uh, where we, we actually uh, increased our speed up to Mach 5 propulsively, and then we used this system to slow us down from Mach 4 down to Mach 2, where we deployed actually a balut, which is a trailing decelerator, and then a parachute. Um, and both this device, the supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator that was attached, and the balut that was trailing, we actually did that test twice, and in both cases, they worked perfectly fine. Parachute did not, by the way, but that's a different story that I won't waste your time on. The other system that we've been heavily involved in is supersonic retropropulsion. And this is something that NASA is interested in, but to be honest with you, most of the attention and most of the interest here comes from SpaceX. Uh, and this is something that I've been working on with SpaceX since about uh, 2011. Um, now, as I mentioned, all previous U.S. Mars landers have landed with propulsion. They do so subsonically. But back in the 60s, they had the idea, instead of using a uh, parachute, why don't we just put more propellant on and start our engines in the supersonic domain? They didn't get very far with that because they couldn't prove it experimentally in the relevant environment conditions, in Mars-like conditions. Uh, you can imagine that there might be some instability issues associated with firing a rocket into an opposing supersonic free stream. You can imagine different angles of attack might have different kinds of performance, different thruster combinations at the extent or at the center of the system might have different performance. Um, and so we did a lot of analysis of this starting back in like the 2005 time frame. And then, as I said, in around 2011, SpaceX got interested in this problem as well. And the reason SpaceX was interested is because every time they return one of the first stages, and I know you've all seen the first stage land, right? <laughs> Haven't you? Yeah. Well, you know, that landing part that you see, that's the boring part. So the really cool part happens way up high. And it's something that they call out, if you're careful and you're listening, they call it the entry burn. And the entry burn occurs supersonically at an altitude that's consistent with Mars. So it's actually a Mars-relevant flight test. And SpaceX, starting in September of 2013, and through now, they've done about 25 of these things. Even when they're not successful at landing, you know, where you see it, down at sea level, they've done an entry burn. And we have the data from all of those flights. And I've actually analyzed the data the supersonic retropropulsion data. Because basically what SpaceX is doing with this entry burn is they're trying to control the environment they're going to see subsequently. So they're trying to slow down a little bit. So it's basically a retro burn in supersonic Mars relevant conditions. And so yeah, NASA, SpaceX, and Georgia Tech worked together uh, to analyze that data. Uh, and it's actually been a treasure trove of data maybe like the most significant data that we've had since the Viking data set from a technology span standpoint of how we might land things on Mars. And I've got a video here that's kind of quicker that we can see. This is from, uh, so what NASA did 
uh, on about a year later in September 2014 is we actually used high altitude NASA aircraft that were instrumented uh, with infrared uh, sensors to watch a SpaceX launch. And so this is a uh, SpaceX launch and what you see here actually, this guy here is the first stage, the little pulsing object and this is the second stage going up. So the first stage is actually initially within the plume still, as you would imagine, of the second stage. And then ultimately the second stage, you know, I'm sorry, the first stage maneuvers out of the second stage plume. That's what those little pulses are. It's maneuvering out of the plume. Uh, and of course the second stage and the payload, they, I don't know, they go on to space or something. I, I, don't, I don't know what happens to them. But the first stage is coming down, right? And so we, instead of following the second stage, we followed the first stage. And it goes up pretty high. It goes up to about 140 kilometers. It depends on mission, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. And then uh, after a while, uh, they do what's called a boost back maneuver. This is basically in space. The boost back maneuver, you know, they've gone down range and they want to come back to the landing site. So they got to come back in space. Uh, and then once they do that, they kind of, it takes a little bit of time, but then they pressurize the system heat it up and they get ready for what I call the re-entry burn, but they call it the entry burn because it's the first time it's entering. We've had this big debate about terminology uh, on this. Uh, and in just a minute, you're going to see uh, one of these supersonic retropropulsion maneuvers that they, they would call out, you know, first stage doing entry burn. That's all you'll hear. Uh, but this is what it would look like if you had an infrared camera and were able to see up to 70 kilometers altitude. So it's powered flight uh, in a retro orientation in Mars relevant conditions, Mars relevant densities, uh, supersonically. Now this is a little saturated in this particular image. There's better data from other flights, but it goes from like 70 to 40 kilometers in this configuration. And then it goes unpowered the rest of the way down to the ground until the very end when it does a little maneuver to find the barge or whatever, right? Uh, and that's the part that you see, right, on TV. But the reason this is so interesting to me is because around the same time uh, at NASA, working with folks at JPL, uh, we came up with an architecture for how you might send humans to Mars that actually closes. Now it's not the greatest architecture, like I wouldn't want to go to Mars this way. <laughs> But I could probably find two people that do, or four people that do. So I could send two of you to Mars for a month, or four of you for about a week uh, this way. Uh, and this system relies very heavily on supersonic retropropulsion. There's no parachutes involved in this descent approach. And my main point here is just like we had to invent new technologies to land MSL and to land Mars 2020, like we're not just relying on what we did from Mars Pathfinder. There's no reason to believe that when we take an order of magnitude or two forward in mass and accuracy and touchdown requirements, that, we're gonna, that these systems are going to look anything like the robotic systems that we've been sending to date. They might look like this. Or, frankly, they might have aeroshells that are really big, hypersonically, so that they change the way we decelerate hypersonically. We might uh, construct those aeroshells in space. Like, you know, we constructed an International Space Station, so surely we might be able to construct a, a 20 meter diameter aeroshell, not just launch a 5 meter diameter shell because that's the biggest fairing that we have. Or we might, like an umbrella, open our aeroshell. That's a concept called a depth that's being pursued at the Ames Research Center, or we might inflate the aeroshell like they did in the 2010 mission, which was a follow on to uh, 2010 movie, which was a follow-on to, to 2001, A Space Odyssey, right? Uh, this is an inflatable, hyperson a hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. Uh, and this system has the unique aerodynamic properties that it's stable hypersonically, supersonically, transonically, and subsonically. So in theory, I can fly this system all the way to the ground, unlike our current aeroshells, uh, which is what this image is showing. Right, I can skip that supersonic de parachute deployment region, don't need to throw out a parachute, I can go right down to the ground and light up my propulsion and go. And in fact, this concept, which has been worked on at NASA Langley for the last few years, uh, they've done sounding rocket tests of this system, they've done a lot of CFD comparison to experiment uh, 
Uh, and this system, even though it has significant heating challenges, because it's so big and lightweight, it has a very low ballistic coefficient, and so those heating challenges are much less. And so even though we're talking about fabric and thin film materials, uh, the design is actually pretty consistent with the heating environment in that phase. Now, I can go on and on and talk to you about different options for how we might land on Mars. The truth is, I don't know. I do know it's feasible. I do know that, you know, in, in, if you had asked me in 2006, I would have said, we don't know and we don't even know if it's feasible. Like today, I would say, well, we don't know but I can tell you two or three ways that we might do it. There's still a lot more work to go, but we've made big progress since, since that time frame. Uh, so what I hope I've, I've ta taught you today is that, you know, EDL is its own domain. Entry, descent, and landing is its own domain. And there's actually a community of people out there. There's hundreds of people out there now across the country that are working on this. They're working on small missions. They're working on large missions. They're even working on sending humans to Mars. Um, and those missions all differ in their requirements, and so they differ in their solutions. Uh, there's no reason to believe that the way we land humans on Mars, you know, in some decade in the future, will be the same as the way we've land robotic missions today. Right? It just, I mean, you're engineers. Certainly you can understand that argument. And so to do that, if we really want to send a two-story house to Mars, and we want to land that two-story house right next to another two-story house that's been pre-positioned and has the power and the oxygen and all those things that the humans need, we're going to need to invest in some of these technologies. Now, there is only a handful of technologies that look good, and there's quite a few that I've thrown off the list that we've proven won't work. But there are some concepts out there, supersonic retropropulsion, slender body aeroshells, uh, inflatable aerodynamic decelerators, that look pretty promising, mostly because of the advances that have been made in materials uh, and our ability on the computational side to actually simulate Mars in a computer. That, you know, a capability they didn't have in the 70s and even, and even the 80s. And by the way, these same techniques, these same capabilities, they're also applicable to missions to the other planets where there's an atmosphere, like to Titan or Venus, or to return samples from the moon, or to return samples from Mars. And so these same people and these same uh, uh, capabilities, they're synergistic with the needs of a wide range of organizations, both government and commercial. Uh, I've been talking about big things, but it's certain, you know, big things to Mars, but it's certainly true there's a ton of work going on right now in small sat missions that have a reentry component, uh, or in rideshare missions, um, you know, or secondary payloads. Uh, and these approaches are relatively low cost ways to get to the surface. I actually think there's, a, there's several university missions in our future, like in the next, say, five years, where we'll take a secondary payload and actually land it on Mars or land it on Titan. Uh, I think that's very much in the realm of possibility. Uh, and with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention and uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I could take questions about being a dean also, but that's not really why I came. <laughs> uh, are there any questions about Mars, landing on Mars? Yeah, trajectory. Is there any potential advantage from starting from a low Martian orbit that you might get into, say, with uh, aero capture? Yeah, so all my examples were direct entry. That's, that's correct. Um, I'm a big fan of direct entry uh, because, you know, it, it's complex to go into orbit first. You have to carry a propulsion system or, you, ha you know, even for aero capture, right, you need a system to get into orbit. Uh, for orbiters, I think aero capture is a great thing a great technology. If you want to go into a big orbit and go check out like the Martian moons, I think it makes a lot of sense. But to actually go into orbit first and then go down to the surface, unless you have some fear that your system's not going to work, which I would argue, why send it? <laughs> um, you know, going into orbit first at Mars doesn't make a lot of sense to me. There's no um, performance benefit, by the way, to do aero capture,
and then to decelerate from orbit, like at starting at like four, four kilometers per second or so. Direct entry is like five and a half to say seven kilometers per second. So they're both hypersonic, right? You need the aeroshell to slow you down hypersonically. But, but the energy the goes as the it's square. It's not of like the, the moon. The energy world. goes as the square of the velocity. So, it's, so there's yeah. a big difference in how much energy you're arriving with, isn't there? Uh, not really. I mean, so bo they both, you're going to need an ablative system to do aero capture, and you're going to need an ablative system to do direct entry from orbit, and you're going to need an ablative system to do direct entry from a, hy a hyperbolic approach. So, and we have thermal protection systems that can easily, you know, Mars is not a large gravity body. It's not like we're, it's not like we're trying to land at Jupiter or something at 60 kilometers per second, right? Or even back at the Earth, interplanetary approach speeds, you know, 11 or 12, 13 kilometers per second. Because we're talking about those lower entry velocities, it's all going to be ablative, and we have systems that can do it. So and it's not really a mass thing. But, but for orbiters, if you're, if you're designing a system to go into orbit, aero capture makes a lot of sense, particularly for big payloads. Like, uh, say we wanted to have a space station at Mars, right? Um, and there are concepts where you have humans in Mars orbit uh, in conjunction with humans on the surface or operating robots on the surface. It would work well there. Any other questions? Yeah. What's your assessment of Elon's EFR going to Mars? Well, um, so I, I mentioned that I've worked uh, a lot with SpaceX, and so I actually got to be careful with how I talk about that. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I, at some small level, I've been involved in the design of that system, so I'm not going to critique something I've been a part of. Uh, I actually think the SpaceX approach is, um, you know, something, it's, it's exciting, right? It's, uh, uh, I think it's very, I think it's, the, all human Mars concepts are challenging. That concept has challenges. But I think it can be made to work. It's basically, uh, you know, the way they fly it. It's a large, slender body in the hypersonic phase with supersonic retropropulsion. So it's not that different, actually, than the technologies that I'm talking about. It's it's an it's a certain instantiation of those technologies. They, you know, and as you know, with SpaceX, if you've been following it, they change their path a little bit here and there as they learn. So uh, I think that they're. Uh, you know, they're pretty confident in their concept today. I would expect that it would morph a little bit between now and the time it flies, but I expect it to fly. Uh, yeah? Which of the projects that you've worked on has been the most challenging? Which of the projects that I've worked on has been most challenging? So I would say without a doubt, um, uh, I would say without a doubt, the Mars Polar Lander. So uh, I mentioned that I've worked on uh, six missions, and five of them were successful. Uh, Mars Polar Lander, which launched along with Mars Climate Orbiter in, in 1999, was not successful. It was my second mission. And many of us that worked on it had suspicions that it might not be successful during the development itself, but there was nothing we could do to stop the train, basically. Uh, we basically landed Mars Pathfinder. Mars Pathfinder cost about $250 million in those year dollars. Uh, and when we were so successful, the, the NASA administrator at that time said, hey, that was great. Go do two missions for the price of one. And we were, you know, I mentioned that there weren't very many Viking people around. There weren't. We were a bunch of young kids that had all just landed on Mars. And so we were like, yeah, we could do it. We could do two for the price of one. So we started off on Mars Polar Lander for basically half the price. And it was a more complicated system than Mars Pathfinder. It was a propulsive landing, like they had done on Viking. And in order to meet the budget, we cut all kinds of testing. And that ended up being what, uh, you know, what was our Achilles heel in that project. Now, you know, on the positive side, we all learned from that. And when many of those lessons learned were applied to Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, to Phoenix, to MSL, and now to Mars 2020. So in some sense, it was a great thing. But going through that failure and the investigation afterwards and the congressional testimony, you know, that's no fun. 
<laughs> That's no fun whatsoever. Sure. Yeah, I'll take a couple more, I guess. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on the difference in footprint size for the different EDL methods? Yeah, so the footprint size uh, largely comes down to two things, right? It comes down to how you fly hypersonically and do you have any control authority when you get near the surface. So most of the error is in, you know, if, if you're not flying with any lift, almost all the error is just targeting and because uh, you're flying ballistically, you have no control authority. So whatever error you have at the top of the atmosphere gets magnified as you go through the atmosphere and there's nothing you can do about it. And so what we did originally is we tried to clamp down on the error at the top of the atmosphere and that's how we went from like 300 kilometers down to 80 kilometers. But at some point there's still uncertainty in the atmosphere. And so the only way to reduce that uncertainty is to actually have some control authority in the domain where the uncertainty is when you're flying through the atmosphere. So that's why we added a lift vector to control basically our downrange and, you know, and our cross range as we're flying in the atmosphere. Once you do that, the only error that's left um, is errors basically in your inertial map relative to the real Mars and those are real errors. And so if you can take imagery uh, uh, during the descent, you can fly out those errors like a, like a cruise missile does in a sense with terrain relative navigation. Okay, and so that's basically the approach to going from hundreds of kilometers down to a football field size amount of error. So is this method applicable to all EDL meth approaches or is that a more specific solution? Uh, I would say that what I just said is applicable to all EDL, although you know the timelines involved are very different between Earth, Titan, Venus, and Mars. Uh, how much the atmosphere is uncertain is different at different planets. You know, like we have a pretty good atmospheric model of the Earth, but a terrible one, you know, at Neptune or Titan, for example. Um, so, you know, there's differences, but that general process is the general process. Thank you. All right, thank you.